Chapter 2 Lex The bartender walked off to fill another drink order as I said the name over in my head. Carter Ross, I repeated, trying to figure out why it sounded vaguely familiar. For the life of me, I couldn't place it. If he's driving an 8C, he's probably loaded. I probably just read about him in the newspaper or something. I reasoned to myself, finishing the food in front of me. I turned back around to survey the lobby and street through the big glass windows. A few more tilts back of my head had me finishing my second glass of wine and feeling, thankfully, more relaxed. I watched out of the corner of my eye as Mr. Ross and the suited man walked into what I presumed to be a side conference room. As soon as he left the space, I felt like some weight had been lifted off of me. Turning around, I paid my bill before asking the bartender where the nightclub Ellen had told me about was. Follow those stairs to the second level. You'll see it on your right-hand side, the bartender said, pointing to a set of stairs on the other side of the lobby. Thanks, I replied, as I turned to follow his directions. Determined to salvage my evening, I climbed the stairs, the music from the club becoming louder and louder, until I finally reached the small line to enter. Upon showing the bouncer my ID, he stamped my hand with a black light stamp and waved me inside. The room was dark and I was immediately surrounded by moving bodies since the entrance lead right onto the dance floor. I managed to push my way through the crowd to find a seat at the circular bar that was surrounded by high tops on the lower level and a raised VIP section above that. Vodka sour! I shouted to the bartender above the din of the music. The man took a little flashlight out of his back pocket, waved it at my wrist to see the stamp before nodding and grabbing ingredients for my drink. He exchanged the drink for a $10 bill, and I turned back around to survey the crowd. I didn't particularly recognize the music that was playing, but I somewhat expected that, given how long it had been since I'd last been to one of these places. The people surrounding me varied in age, but Ellen had been right. Most of them were around my age, if just younger in maturity level. Looking out at the dance floor, I couldn't help but chuckle into my drink as I watched one man doing what could only be classified as jazzercise. The reaction from the people around him was mixed, with some looking at him in confusion and the others just giving him his space and continuing to move to the music themselves. People shifting on the dance floor caught my attention. Looking over, I noticed dirty blonde hair making its way through the crowd. My eyes widened, and I turned back around to face the center of the bar, before tipping my head back to gulp down the rest of my third drink for the evening. I knew his eyes were on me. Somehow I could feel it, like an itch between my shoulder blades. The feeling passed, and I sighed as the liquor settled into my system nicely. Feeling a bit more relaxed, I tapped my glass for a refill before chancing a look over my shoulder to see where Mr. 8C had gone. I noticed him a few feet away, talking to the bouncer that was standing in front of the VIP section. He looked absolutely gorgeous in his fitted V-neck black tee and dark jeans. Some very uncouth thoughts flashed in my brain about just what I would like to do with Mr. Ross, preferably in his car, and I couldn't help but smile and shake my head. The bartender returned with my drink, and I passed him another $10 bill before taking the glass in one hand and pulling the cherry on top into my mouth. As my lips closed around the fruit, something caused me to look up, and my gaze met one intensely dark and green from across the room. We stayed there, the din around us fading away as the intensity grew between us. I could feel a blush dust my cheeks before I finally broke eye contact. Since the first moment I'd seen this man, he was threatening my sense of control. It put me on edge, in a way that almost thrilled me as much as it frightened me. Turning back to the bar, I tipped the drink back quickly, the warmth from the vodka hitting me quite suddenly before placing the glass down and hurrying towards the entrance. I made my way back towards where I had entered, pushing my way through the crowd as I went. I could see that Mr. Ross had moved towards my location now, about to push his own way through the crowd. When I finally reached my destination, the bouncer there shook his head. Exit's on the other side, ma'am. What? I huffed in disbelief. The lights and music felt somewhat disorienting now, and I turned around, trying to follow where the bouncer was pointing. 
I started pushing people out of the way as I tried to make my way to the exit. I needed air, I needed space, and I needed Mr. Ross to stop following me so I could think. I was certain I wouldn't be able to speak to him intelligently, and I really didn't want to embarrass myself again. I managed to make it through the crowd, avoiding the hunter as if I were some prey, and crossed the room quickly to reach the set of stairs down to the lobby. As soon as I escaped the din from above, I felt so much better. I inhaled deeply as I took a seat at one of the tucked-away armchairs, and froze as I heard a deep, baritone voice behind me. Hey, wait up. I looked up to see Carter Ross descending the staircase, heading straight towards me. There was no way that I could run now. If I did, it would be extremely rude. Putting a smile on my face, I tried to rein back my thoughts about wrapping my legs around the man and waited for him to meet me at my location. Didn't you hear me calling to you back there? he asked, his voice deep and his eyes fixated just on me. I was finding it hard to breathe again, and I internally berated myself for letting this man have such control over me. So what? He's gorgeous. There's no reason I cannot pull it together to have a normal conversation with him, I reasoned with myself. Sorry, I must have missed it, I lied. Mr. Ross took a seat in the armchair next to me and narrowed his eyes slightly before saying, don't try and bullshit a bullshitter. I couldn't help but smile and his mood seemed to lift slightly with mine. Somehow, with the two of us alone like this, he didn't seem as intimidating. My confidence grew as I began to feel more like myself. How can I be of service? I asked, immediately regretting my choice of words because my brain started running clips of me on my knees in front of him. I knew I was likely blushing, but I tried to recover by looking down and swiping a piece of stray hair back into my bun. He took a moment to really look me over, as if he were trying to come up with the perfect answer to my question. I met his gaze this time, the alcohol in my system bolstering my courage. In a bold move, I reached my hand up to brush back a piece of his hair that had fallen down. Up close to him like this, I noticed a jagged scar traveling down the right side of his face. My fingers traced it gently, and the man's gaze on me intensified. Of course, a part of me wanted to know about this scar. Was it only skin deep, or was there a story behind it that went deeper? But I also knew stories like that shouldn't be asked for, they should be given. I pulled my hand back, letting it rest on his knee, my thumb rubbing a lazy circle against the denim. My attitude had flipped from flustered and embarrassed before to a cool sense of confidence now. I continued to meet his gaze, but didn't say a thing about his scar, instead waiting for him to ask his initial question. I just wanted to introduce myself, he said, still holding my gaze. Carter Ross, he said, placing his hand atop mine. Lex Evanston, I replied, purposefully scrambling my last name. Well, Ms. Evanston he said in his deep baritone, his own hand rubbing circles against my wrist and causing me to shiver slightly. Do you have any plans this evening? Um, I knew immediately what this man wanted from me with that question. Perhaps it had been what he had meant to propose to me when he first sat next to me at the bar. The more logical side of me began to run through all of the bad scenarios that could result, starting at most severe with murder and working its way down to him being a disappointment in bed. But the other side, the side that had given me the courage to start this new life, the side that had given me the courage to speak to him in the first place, and incidentally, the side that was currently benefiting from a few drinks, whispered, just give in. I looked him over. His gaze was still fixated on me. Of all the men I had met, Carter Ross looked like he would be incredibly discreet. Having made up my mind, I cocked my head to one side, cast him a small smile and replied, I'm wide open. The tension increased between us, and it felt like ages as I waited for his reply. You're not from here, are you? He asked me. His question surprised me. He didn't seem like the sort of man to want details on his one-night stands. I shook my head. No, I replied simply, deciding not to exchange any further information. I didn't want details about his life either. The only thing I truly wanted from this man was the release I knew he could give me. His lips lifted, not into a smile. This man didn't look like he did that often, but there was a look of contentment on his face. 
He closed his eyes briefly, then stood, keeping his hand wrapped around mine. Then, can I give you a tour? He asked smoothly. I nodded. I'd love that. I stood, his hand leading me towards the resort's exit through the rotating doors. He turned towards the valet kiosk. Where's Michael? He asked the attendant on duty. The youth cowered a bit at his commanding tone. He's gone for the evening, the teenager responded, his voice cracking just the slightest. I looked up to see a scowl on Carter's face, and I held back a smile. It really did fit him, just as I had guessed. I'd be happy to get the car for you, sir, the attendant continued, obviously trying his best. Carter turned, clapping the kid on the shoulder in a friendly gesture. The boy flinched anyways. No offense, but Michael's the only one I trust with my cars. Space number? Carter asked, holding his hand out for the key. 27, the valet responded, placing the key in his palm. Be right back, Carter said, almost to both of us, as he jogged towards the car. The teenager looked at me, and I shook my head. Don't ask me, I replied quickly, getting ahead of the question. No clue why Michael's so special. The boy sighed a bit defeated. I wouldn't worry about it, I added, trying to cheer him up. He smiled at me before both of us were startled by the sound of an engine starting. I couldn't help but smile. Alphas were so flashy. Carter pulled the car around, this time with the top down, and put it in park before getting out to open the door for me. As I got into the car, I noticed him palm the kid a $20 bill. I love how your driver's side door opens and closes. I said over the rumble of the engine. Carter looked at me in confusion. I laughed. My alpha's from the 80s. Door handle broke years ago. I have to hop over the side to get in and out. Carter's eyebrows lifted slightly before he buckled his seatbelt. I did the same, and he shook his head. I'm fairly certain that means your car isn't road legal. Ooh, that just makes it sound like I drive a test car. I giggled. In what I presumed was an uncharacteristic move for Carter Ross, he winked at me before turning his attention to the road.